On big projects, what are my timelines like? What do I include in contracts before I start a project? What did my postcard look like, the one that I sent to my agents? These are the questions I answer, and before that, a little bit of chit chat. Hey guys, happy Monday. My name is Tom Froze, and this is the Making Friends vidcast. This is where I answer your questions about illustration. So this is episode 20, guys. 20 episodes. I've been doing this since February, weekly, and I'm pretty surprised that I've been able to keep it up this long. And I'm super excited that you guys have been following along and and uh, subscribing and liking and asking questions, most importantly, asking questions. So yeah, thanks for sticking around and watching and, and supporting what I'm doing here. I'm doing it for you guys. I'm making content for you guys to watch, not for me to watch. So it's for you guys. So anyway, uh, yeah, this week, uh, how, was, how was your week? My week was a little better than the last. If you caught my last episode, episode 19, I got pretty personal and vulnerable with, with you guys and just shared some of my emotional challenges from this year so far. And I'm pleased to say that the week is definitely going better. I'm, I'm happier overall. And I think it has something to do with regaining control of my schedule, of my life. You know, I have, uh, I had a lot of projects. It was very crazy and busy and hectic start to my year. At times having 14, 15 projects on the go at once becomes very hard to manage. And so I kept putting off deadlines, asking for more mercy, asking for extensions. And they sort of just went on and on until I, I, I had all these loose ends untied, all these projects unfinished. And I'm just now starting to wrap up a lot of those projects and um, really get back in the game, making sure I'm on top, procrastinating less and definitely getting more in touch with working for the client rather than just defending my art. That means just s s small things like answering my emails as soon as I can instead of waiting days before I get back to some people. It means just having an overall friendlier tone and making sure that I'm I'm being considerate and friendly and coming across as such even when it, it, I'm, I feel too busy to take the time to do that. So I'm also working on not taking myself too seriously. This is a lifelong habit of mine, taking myself too seriously. And over the last few years, I've really embraced the artist side of commercial art and have grown very used to pushing back, defending my artistic decisions, you know, making sure that my artistic vision comes through and I think that's a very important thing for commercial artists, illustrators, designers to learn how to do but it often comes at the expense of being friendly and cooperative and working with the client. So yeah I think it's super important that we as artists learn what is negotiable and what isn't negotiable in our artistic decisions in our style but we also need to balance that with being flexible and adaptable and ultimately working for the client, not for ourselves. I feel like it was harder when I was really busy in the most hectic part of this year. It was really hard to remember the client in the way that I should. And I feel like the last couple of weeks feeling depressed for maybe inexplicable reasons I I found it easier to be more humble and in touch. And I think this is just a, a positive side effect of, of depression, actually, is that you can, um, you just feel more connection to other people and you, you, you um, it's just easier to be humble and work cooperatively with others. So I'd say that's the silver lining there. Okay, so why am I sharing this stuff with you? Why am I getting so vulnerable? Well, I didn't, ever intend on getting this vulnerable in this vidcast and being very personal. I always thought that I would keep it arm's length and strictly professional 
talk about things like what projects I like or dislike or, you know, other things like that, especially in the chit chat. And of course, I always intend on bringing you all that stuff in the Q&A period, but the chit chat is becoming much more personal. And yeah, I like to bring you guys whatever's on my mind. And my hope is that usually it's more that it is less personal and more about, you know, stuff that everybody can be interested in. But right now, because I'm working through these things, both personally and as a professional illustrator, this is what I have to bring you guys. And I do feel that this is valuable. And my hope is that by being so vulnerable and transparent, I can encourage others to do that same hard work of looking inside and just seeing how you're really doing. You know, I think it's easy to just get caught up in all the superficial things that we do every day and never really take the right amount of time to look inside and and say like how am i really doing like am i happy how am i treating myself how am i treating others just to take that step back and assess the situation from afar so to speak i value both being a successful commercial artist but also a compassionate loving person and i think it's a lot easier to be one or the other than to be both it's ultimately the hardest to do this, to take a good hard look under the hood, to see all the greasy and grimy parts under the hood, and to be honest about the fact that it's not all shiny and new and glorious. It's a lot harder to do something about all of it and change. So this continues to be on my mind a lot, to keep focused on doing great work, earning a decent living, and to do all this while holding my esteemed clients in the highest regard and treating them as I would want to be treated myself. Ultimately, this is not only going to bring me more peace of mind, but it will also ensure that my business continues to thrive as clients will come to me for the quality of my illustrations, but they'll stay and keep coming back for the quality of my customer service. Okay, let's just jump right into Q&A. I have three questions to go through today. And the first one comes from Joanna. And this one comes from YouTube. Regarding the project you shared in episode 13, what do my sketches look like? How much time did you put into it? And what was the deadline like? It seems a rather massive assignment. So thanks, Joanna, for your question. And very good question. Of course, it's always interesting to know when you look at a project, how, lo how much time did it really take? And like, how on earth did you finish it, especially when it's that big? So what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to jump into screen grab mode here and just kind of walk you through it. So I think that'll be a better way to answer the question. OK, so the project that Joanna is talking about is my illustrations for Fraser Commons. So Fraser Commons is a condo development, like a tower that's being built in Vancouver. And instead of photography, the client wanted to use illustration. And there were a lot of illustrations. There was a lot of work involved in this project. It was massive. So there were 10 of these lifestyle illustrations. And some of these are here on my portfolio website. So these lifestyle illustrations were vignettes, little moments of life in and around the condo and in the neighborhood. So there's people getting on and off of a bus to talk about transit, what kind of transit is available there. And then there's one about the green space around the building. So, you know, people having a picnic and enjoying the outdoors. You know, there's there is going to be a daycare so they had an illustration they wanted an illustration showing someone being dropped kids being dropped off and stuff like that so there are 10 of those and then there was what's called a hero illustration and this was a more detailed piece about the actual condo towers themselves so this was you know crazy intimidating for me because I don't always draw architecture, we'll say. I don't really 
focus in my work a lot on details or things that are supposed to be realistic. And so it was fun working on this that kind of blended my whimsy with an actual realistic building. And so I had to make sure that I had the number of floors right and, and that at least represented the building to some degree of realism. So that was that was a lot of work there. And then, of course, I had to do a map, which is its own can of worms. So yeah, this project was huge. And I'm going to say it took me six months to do. And that included creating the sketches, going back and forth on the content of the actual sketches, and then making revisions to the final art. And the thing that probably took me the longest was the map because the map had basically, it was like a map is an illustration with illustrations inside of it. Each little vignette on the map, each little icon, like each landmark that I had to illustrate was its own illustration, basically. I'd, I'd say there's probably, you know, three weeks of actual illustration work in that project. And then the six months was really fluffed out with the like back and forth and waiting for the client to get back about their feedback. And then in one or two cases, there were some images that the client was indecisive about. So they, they weren't sure whether they wanted to depict a certain scenario in a certain way. And so it took them a long time to say, okay, we now know how we're going to use this ninth and these ninth and 10th lifestyle illustrations. Uh, we want it to be about this and about that. So yeah, timeline was about six months. Uh, I probably spent about three solid weeks working on it. And then the rest is just filled in with, you know, back and forth and waiting and making decisions and stuff like that. Meanwhile, you know, I, I have other projects on the go as well. So you, you kind of just fill in. It's not like I spent six months solid only working on this project. That's unsustainable. I would have had to <laughs> charge a lot more for that project if if that was the case, because uh, they would have basically had to pay me half of your salary. And that's just not how illustration works. I, I guess that that also answers the deadline question. The deadline was very flexible. I mean, we had an ultimate deadline to work toward, but they gave me like, we started talking about this project probably a year in advance. And so there was lots of time to sort of plan and work on it. And they were really great about giving me the time I needed and being flexible, especially if there was a holdup on their end. They were very gracious about, you know, acknowledging that the delay was on their end and giving me a little bit more time on my end, to be fair. So it was a, it was actually a wonderful project. Client was awesome. The agency I worked with was um, fantastic. And I'm very happy about how the illustrations turned out and even how they were used. The next question comes from Anya on YouTube. And she asks if I would mind sharing my experience with agreements and contracts. Do I offer the client some type of document with terms of collapse? collaboration before I start the project. So great question, Anya. And the answer is yes, yes. I always include a contract and have the client approve the contract before I go into a project. With bigger clients, like publishing clients, usually that contract comes from the client and we just work on that contract. But contracts always include what the illustration is. So it's very specific about like if it's you know, three illustrations for a website, you know, you, you say three illustrations for a website. If those illustrations are supposed to be for a certain subject, you write in what that subject is about um, in brief. And then you want to include how big the illustrations are, you know, what dimensions they are, what file format they should be submitted in, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you also want to include how many revisions you will provide on sketches and on final art. You wanna include how many sketches or different concepts you'll provide at the beginning. So I always try to include two or three options as sketches. And then once a client chooses one of those, we create the final art and the client has three rounds of changes to that. And if we go beyond three changes, at that point, we can negotiate 
additional fees for more changes. And that just keeps uh, everybody focused and and taking every revision round seriously and and prevents you from getting into 9, 10, 11 changes uh, and, and not being able to charge more for the extra time that you didn't account for. So in the terms and conditions of my estimates, I always have um, a, a wording around me keeping copyright. So I get to use the images for self-promotion. I get to put it on my, my, my website. I get to use it in social media because if you can't use the work that you create for a client, the value of that work for you as an artist goes down dramatically. Every illustration you create for a client is ideally a promotional piece that you can use to get more work by showing it on your portfolio. I worked once for a film company on a TV series that had celebrities in it and the celebrities were like holding my illustration in it, but I cannot share the work for this client because in the contract it, it said I, I cannot share this work and this was early on in my career so like you know this is going back five years I was less experienced and I was just happy to get the work and uh, unfortunately uh, I, I couldn't have used that impressive project with the impressive client to gain more work and exposure and that's a shame because you know it's great that I did the work and that the client liked it and that I got paid but yeah, it's just a shame that I, I couldn't actually show and tell what I did. And that's such a huge, important thing for commercial artists is to be able to share our work and promote ourselves with it. If a client is asking, telling you that you can't use the work, um, that you have to keep it a secret and never tell anyone that you did it, you better be paid a lot for it. Uh, in which case, then you can make compromises like that. So I also include, um, you know, usage, like how the client will use it, the, the artwork. So maybe it's for a website and for a magazine and social media. And that, that, that means that like, if they wanted to also use it for packaging or other applications, maybe you can uh, set a price that reflects that additional usage. And, and by kind of including all these specific usage uh, terms in, in the contract, it allows you to have that conversation in the future if they want to start using your illustration work for other things and you can begin to leverage additional fees uh, for, the, for the same work and it's very helpful in that way. I include a delivery schedule so when sketches are due and when illustrations are due, just have that in writing. I include, um, like I said, I include how many revisions are due. I even go so far in my contract to say how I would prefer to receive um, client feedback and I say the client is responsible to put all the revisions from, um, you know, no matter if it's 20 people all feeding back through email, I expect all that feedback to be put into one single document or one place for me to see and to give that to me one time. And then I, I will uh, work from, those, from that document on those changes and that will be a, a single revision. And that just keeps, it defines what a revision is how a revision happens and what happens um, after that revision has been completed. Meaning, you know, you go into a second round of revisions and then once I get to version three, uh, I start talking about charging additional fees. And uh, I have a payment schedule. This is very important. Uh, some people will ask for payment right away so sort of like if you go to the dentist you know you, your dentist fills your cavity and then you go to the desk before leaving out that door you have to pay the dentist for that cavity on that day and uh, that's not really the way it is for most illustrators most of us are net 30 so we invoice the client and um, they need to pay that invoice in 30 days I'll be uh, my my invoices are always net 30, so payment in full is due within 30 days of the date on this invoice. And, and then, of course, I talk about whether interest will be charged after that time. And um, we can go into more detail on that some other time. So I also include this very important 
aspect called cancellation and kill fees. What happens if the project cancels midway through? Do they owe you money? What if they kill the project? So this is, the, I'll, this is where I'll actually read what I have. So in the event of cancellation or breach by the client, I will retain ownership of all rights of copyright and their original work, including sketches and any other preliminary materials, and the client will return all copies and permanently delete all copies thereof. The client will pay me according to the following schedule, 50% of the original fee if cancelled after sketches, and 75% if cancelled after presentation of finished artwork. So this is my way of saying if you kill the project on your with you know if I'm holding up upholding my end of the bargain here and I'm creating the work but then you decide you need to cancel the project if I've shown you sketches then you owe me 50% of the full fees that were in the quote and for me uh, this seems fair because about half the work goes into the sketches and by the time I've shown one sketch to the client, I've done half the work. And if I go all the way and create a finished piece of artwork based on the sketch and the client says, oh, we don't need the illustration anymore, we're canceling it. Um, I ask for 75% uh, of the full fees. And that means the client cannot use the artwork, but they still owe me 75% of the full fees that I would have gotten if they actually used the artwork. And that's just because, you know, so much of what I charge for an illustration is actually the amount of work and time I put into it. And then the remaining lost 25% that I won't charge is based on um, how the image was supposed to be used. So the client's not getting any value from the illustration anymore. They've only, you know, taken my time. And so you want to account for your time that you spent on these illustrations, regardless of whether the client has changed their mind or canceled the project altogether. Um, another thing that I include in my my quotes or my contracts is a wording around alterations or changes. So I basically uh, say that I I am the one who should make any changes to the artwork. Don't have your intern go in and uh, open the Photoshop file and try and change colors and stuff like that. I should be the first person you go to to ask for such changes. Um, and then, of course, if you're not available, then the client might have a you know there might be some reason why the client should hire someone else to make those changes if you're too busy or something like that but you should always include that because if you don't the client can do anything with your illustration it might even have your name on it and then it doesn't look at all like the way you wanted it to look or think it should look according to your standards and that's that's a funny place to be lastly if it's a quote that i'm sending the client i put a time limit on it so i say the quote's valid for 30 days that allows me to um you know if the client disappears for 30 days and then comes back you know even longer than 30 days six months later uh and i feel like i want to adjust the pricing and stuff i'm entitled to do that because the quote had an expiry date so that is that is really um a long-ish answer to your question about agreeing on a contract before going into an illustration. And I, I would stress to you guys, do not do any work, don't lift a finger until you have some kind of contract. It can be simple, it doesn't have to be as elaborate as the one that I've just talked through, but don't do any work until you've defined what the project is and what the terms are. And for anyone who um, wants to know where I learned how to do this, it's this book here, The Graphic Artist Guild Handbook to Pricing and Ethical Guidelines. This is edition 14. I think they're up to a higher edition number now, maybe 15. What's great about this book is in the back, they have um, these sort of examples of contracts for different kinds of creatives, whether you're an illustrator or a web designer or a surface designer. And they, um, so they include kind of templates, but they also include sort of the legal terms terms and conditions that would go with a certain kind of contract and yeah so i'm not giving you legal advice of course and i'm not telling you exactly what to include in your contract or how to go about that and so i would definitely recommend you consult a legal professional for that but if you want to see what 
um, what standard to include, check out this book, check out their um, terms and agreements and contracts that are in the back of the book. And what I did is I just went through and kind of picked a few that I liked and reworded them according to the way I work. And I, I changed the tone of voice a little, so it's a, a little less legalese. And uh, that's been working for me. And so far, so good. So yeah, thanks, Anya, for your question. If you guys uh, feel like I left a lot of holes in that answer, feel free to kind of ask me for some clarity on any points that you felt needed clarifying. Okay, so this next question comes from Debbie via email, and she says, I've been in the process of building up my portfolio, and I'm currently looking for an agent and finding it a challenge, as most agencies are outside of Canada. So she's a Canadian illustrator here. I've created a website and emailed a number of agencies with one reply advising they keep me in mind if they had something that would fit my style in the future. I'm just wondering by chance if you have a sample of the postcard you use to attract representation. So thanks Debbie for your question and absolutely yes I can share with you the postcard I used but um, I should just say you know whatever what I used to promote my work was very specific to my kind of work and my style so I'm not sure how relevant it will be to your style and what you provide. I think the most important thing is when you're contacting an agent, make sure that you feel that there's a fit, that there's overlap between what the agent um, typically represents in their uh, roster of illustrators. So are they more into the kids lit realm? Are they m mostly um, advertising illustration? Are they editorial? Or stylistically, are they um, do they fit within a certain category? Does do this does the style of the illustrators or the tone or the mood um, of the illustrators that they represent kind of feel like your illustration? Do you fit into that group? And so I think that's really the most important question when you're looking for illustrators is not even what country they're in or you know what what kind of promotional piece you're going to send them but would your work belong in their roster and so that's that the other thing is if you're going to create a promotional piece and a post postcard's a great way of doing that i mean i think there's a reason the postcard is popular is because it you know it's a great little canvas to put your work on and it mails easily and it's is not too wacky. Like people know what a postcard is, not gonna be like, hey, what the heck is this? And throw it in the garbage. Um, you know, they're gonna look at a postcard and say, okay, this illustrator is promoting themselves to me. Do I like the image I see on this piece of paper? And and then maybe they'll keep it or maybe they'll, you know, put it in the recycling. But so what I did when I mailed out my own promotional postcards to illustration agencies was I created a piece, I'm going to show it to you in a sec, I created a piece that reflected the style of illustration that I wanted to do. And this was going back uh, a few years now, and I still actually use this card to promote myself, but uh, I now have two agents, so I'm not looking for agents now. I, I would definitely make a different kind of promotional piece today. Um, but at the time, I created a lot of um, very simple and fun kind of vintagey illustrations with uh, kind of more abstract things in it and it really lent itself well to letterpress so i created a postcard and had it letterpress printed this is the card that i made and sent out you know i don't know if the camera's going to show it well but you know it's it's letterpress there's a t texture to it it's a nice solid ink when you run your hands over the different bits you really feel where the ink was pressed into the thick paper I don't know if you can see how thick the paper is there and just a, a really simple uh, thing on the back I have just Tom Froze design and illustration tomfroze.com my my preference is to keep it simple and elegant and make something that someone's going to want to keep um, I don't like shiny postcards because they feel like flyers that you get you know from real estate agents in the mail. So you want whatever you do to stand out. And most importantly, you want the work that you show to look like the kind of work you promise to do for that agent. 
and are excited about and that you think that they would be excited about in their clients. So that's a postcard. I actually talked about this postcard in even more detail, if you can believe it, in a talk that I did uh, at Type Brigade in Vancouver last year. And that is actually um, in video here on my YouTube channel, and you can check that out. I'll leave the, the link to it in the show notes. Okay, guys, thank you so much for your questions. Today was a real doozy. I feel like you guys asked um, questions that really, really got me like digging into my my like my resources here, into my portfolio and and my um, even my contracts and stuff like that. So happy to answer them as usual, and I'm excited to keep getting your questions and answering more of them. Okay, guys, that's it for today. Man, I still can't believe that it's been 20 episodes. I'm both surprised and a little bit sad. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that I've kept this thing going for 20 weeks. That's 20 episodes, 20 half days, probably 10 full work days since February that I've spent making these things, talking to you guys, reading your great questions, and trying to answer the best that I can. I'm not even going to count the countless days I've spent working or wondering about you guys and how you guys are enjoying the content and whether I should be doing this at all given my other obligations, but that's a whole other thing. So I said I was surprised, but I'm also sad. Uh, I'm sad because this is my last full episode until the end of the summer. And so that means school's out, guys. Uh, with just about two weeks left to go until Icon in Detroit, uh, and then another few weeks away outside my studio, I need to set this vidcast down and prioritize other things I have going on. So thanks so much, guys, for all your questions and for cheering me on in the comments and for your emails. I love receiving every one of them. I really do get a sense that we're building a community here and that this has been a worthwhile venture so far. I hope you guys have a great summer and I'm really looking forward to getting back and sharing all that I learned while I was away. Please keep your questions coming. I'll be collecting them here and definitely banking them up for future episodes. My name is Tom Froze. You can find my work at tomfroze.com and in all the social medias. My links are in the notes. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up. And every like is like a little cheerleader on my shoulder saying, keep doing this. If you're a fan of the vidcast, please hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell. If you hit the bell button, you'll be notified when the next video drops. And this will be especially useful since my posts will be a little bit less predictable until the fall. All right, that's it from me. Keep making great work and asking great questions. I'll see you in September.